Start with giving him a hand. He traveled okay. far. Thank you. I feel like a DJ or a, you know performer <laughs> or something. This is an unusual um, configuration for me, but we'll 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 press ahead. Um, I want to think with you today about strategies for digital design. Asta emphasized in her preliminary remarks the importance of interdisciplinarity for the archive project, and obviously interdisciplinarity is key to thinking about designing for these new uh, technical um, and, and social media uh, environments that we have. Um, I'm going to talk specifically about work that I'm doing with my colleague Maria Angberry and uh, Blair McIntyre in, uh, at Georgia Tech. And I want to ground my discussion uh, in a specific technology and with specific examples, but I hope that there is also a larger um, message, a larger issue that I will be um, confronting. I want to take AR technology, as Asta suggested, as an example and then explore that as a design paradigm. Um, Jason mentioned AR in passing and uh, the question of the efficacy of, cur of current AR systems just came up, as a matter of fact. Um, I'd like to take you through some examples of what augmented reality is today and then talk about a very specific possibility, in, indeed, in relation to um, effectsity and things that Susan uh, mentioned just now, uh, that AR might be in the future. So like so many of the other digital media technologies that we're uh, used to now, augmented reality is, has been pioneered by games. And um, there are a number of game consoles, like the Nintendo 3DS, the Wii and Kinect systems that have been making games more physical, more embodied, more involved uh, with a different kind of interaction paradigm involving the physical space as well as the screen. And now in particular, we have the advent of a new genre, a new uh, generation of AR games on mobile phones and mobile devices. One of these uh, is actually a collaboration between the uh, my uh, colleagues at the Georgia Institute of Technology and the Savannah College for Art and Design called Nerd Herder. And I wanted to show it to you simply as an example of the kind of interaction paradigms that AR games make possible. Um, bear with me for a minute to see if I can get uh, the video to play on Nerd Herder as we, uh, as we show it to you. Okay, well. We have video. Let's see if we can keep it. They need to talk to each other. There we go. Okay. So the, the premise is that you're, uh, this is, I suppose, I suppose you call this a god game. You're trying to control a bunch of nerds who work in an office. And of course, you know that nerds like donuts. So you need to grab a donut and then you see the nerd will follow you along. If you can go over the star, you'll get points, you see. But the goal is, in this case, to get the nerd over to his desk. So he starts working. There. Success. Okay. Um, since I had success, I won't go on to the 107 other levels. Um, but uh, it consists of either uh, that kind of interaction of either positive or negative forces. So, for example, you use donuts to lure your nerds to the office, or you can use paperwork to scare them away and make them go you know, where you want them to go. Um, I think it's a very cute um, game that indicates the kind of interactions, as I said, that you that are even currently being explored with augmented reality game technology. So the, the interesting thing about augmented reality as a design in, for, in terms of games is that you're designing for a space that's both the screen and in the world, and your interaction is actually very physical. Um, the device itself becomes a joystick. Um, in a certain sense, these games become even more physical and embodied than uh, using a joystick with a game console in a traditional game. But AR is more than games, and uh, we're exploring a number of affordances and design paradigms at the Augmented Environments Lab at Georgia Tech which is directed by my colleague uh, Blair McIntyre, has been for over 10 years now. Um, and what's interesting about the work that's gone on at the lab is that in the time that we've been working, and certainly in the time that my colleague Blair has been working in augmented reality, augmented reality has moved from a laboratory technology to 
a consumer technology, and the way that it's done, made that movement has been with a kind of a, a willingness to accept a certain set of constraints. When it was a laboratory technology, um, work, uh, work was done, research was done with elaborate tracking systems often built into the ceiling and with um, head-mounted displays. And while work continues with head-mounted displays, and as uh, Jason was suggesting, maybe the future of augmented reality might involve um, wearing glasses of some sort, that, or even having um, contact lenses or retinal um, uh, lasers that, that write directly on your retina, certainly the present and near future of augmented reality belongs to mobile technology. And it is mobile technology, smartphones and tablets, that have made augmented reality into a consumer level product, which also allows it to become a medium in the social sense. Because now you can have millions, potentially millions of people, hundreds of thousands or millions of people using uh, your augmented reality application to communicate and to represent and to express themselves in ways that when it was a laboratory technology was only a dream. Um, I want to talk about, uh, as I'm narrowing down here, specifically a class of augmented reality applications called AR browsers. And um, I'm going to let my colleague Blair uh, introduce the Argon AR browser, which is the one that was developed at the lab in Georgia Tech. Argon is an augmented reality web browser for the iPhone. When we created Argon, we wanted to create a platform that allows people to create, distribute, and experience mobile augmented reality using the same skills, tools, and technologies they use right now to create and deliver websites. So if we think about what the web has enabled, where anybody who has a little bit of information can put it out there, and if it's interesting to you, you can get it. So your neighborhood grocery store, your Barnes and Nobles could have a coupon or local specials, and they're available to you on the web, and we use this all the time. There's nothing like that for mobile augmented reality right now. The only kinds of apps that are out there are things where people have had the time, effort, and funds to create a significant application. What we want to do is allow the local grocery store owner to put up their specials. So when you look around their store, you can see the specials located around you rather than on the screen in 2D. Or if you think about um, fans of TV shows like Sex and the City, if you go to New York, you can take a Sex and the City tour of New York. You can find websites where people map out where all the episodes took place. Those fans who've created those websites could simply add a few scripts, make their website Argon enabled, and now you could go and take a walking augmented reality tour of New York based on your favorite TV show. What we're doing with Argon is letting people create their own interfaces, their own mashups of this information in much the same way that they create websites and deliver it to people. So I could go outside and look around and see what you want me to see, the Flickr images you care about, and have the additional interactions and behaviors that, that you wanted to convey to me, not what some app developer specifically wanted to do. So that's a little bit self-promotional there, but I wanted to show to you particularly so that you would see the scenes of the interaction that uh, the browser Argon allows uh, with the phone. You look around in your physical environment and, the, and information in the form typically of graphics and some text is overlaid in position on that environment. Argon is not by any means the only um, browser, AR browsers. Uh, it's become a class of applications. Someone mentioned Wikitude. There's also Erasma, which uh, Susan represented, Layer, Junio, a number of them. It's becoming a genre already with its own affordances and um, design elements. Um, the uh, makers of Layer, which is probably the most uh, commercially successful of these browsers, have already begun to talk about two different modes of uh, information or relationships between you and information that these browsers afford. One is geolocated information where you hold up the phone, look around you, and you see the information in space depending upon your particular location in the world. And the other is um, what they call um, video-based AR for um, tracking images and things that might be on magazines or on um, uh, it could be logos if you're in a commercial environment, where you hold the phone up to the magazine. It doesn't really matter where you are in the world. It's, it works the same whether you're in New York or, or Copenhagen or Malmö. But what it does is it puts uh, Im images, 
uh, information, it enhances or augments your experience of that particular um, uh, video, that uh, image, and um, potentially uh, could provide um, more information and could change the nature of a, of a kind of book that you're reading. These different, these two kinds of classes of AR are beginning to, as I say, develop, um, and we can see c some common design elements that are going, uh, that are that are becoming uh, popular in those two um, different um, versions, vision-based and geolocation-based uh, AR. Text and images floating in space, clickable elements to give you information, and the location control of delivery being the ones in geolocation, and the uh, ones down there listed for vision-based include QR codes. Um, the, the images tend to float above the space, the surface of the table or the magazine, and the mobile device itself is the controller of, of uh, your interaction with that information. Now I want to talk very specifically about a very different kind of uh, application that uh, these mobile devices are facilitating. And it is an application that uh, I will call AR panoramas. I'm not sure whether a augmented reality panoramas has become a term of art yet, but it, there are a number of panorama applications, one of which, for example, is tourist which invites both professionals and amateurs, it's a user-driven content site, to upload their panoramas to uh, their, their database. And then it becomes possible to see panoramic views of locations um, with your phone. Um, I'm going to show you what, no, actually, I'm going to wait on that. Um, another different. Uh, application in this same space, Google Street View is a, is a giant panorama uh, application, but the Google Art Project is a more specific one uh, in which 150 museums and galleries have collaborated with Google to make art collections available online in high resolution images. And part of that um, project is a kind of street view for museum, museums in which users can go into museums and the featured museums and see a 360 degree panorama of the location. So for example, you could go to the Acropolis Museum in Athens and actually move around that museum in a street view. This is not actually Google Street, uh, the Google Art Project is not uh, for panoramic on the mobile phone, it's panoramic in, um, on the screen, but it's part of this larger design space. So um, Maria Engberry has been working on a project called uh, Les Lumières de Saint-Étienne, which is a, an AR uh, tour of the uh, Saint Stephen Saint-Étienne Cathedral in Metz, France. And it's an example of a cultural heritage application that uses panoramas. Um, and I wanted to show, see if I could use that to show you what it actually feels like to have this panoramic display in on the iPad. Yes. So here we are in the cathedral. And you see that um, by turning the orientation, obviously I'm not in the cathedral, so it's not sensing my location. But the orientation sensors in the iPad allow me to examine the space. This similar to the uh, experience that you would get from Tourist or a number of the other panorama apps that are also available for the phone, although this is happening in Argonne. Now what's interesting is the way I feel my way around the space, the way I have this tactile or proprioceptive uh, relationship to the image, which is rather a different way from exper of experiencing the image from certainly from you know looking at a picture or photograph on a wall or from other ways in which panoramas have been made available um, in the past. So the point of uh, this uh, particular uh, cultural heritage application, the, um, the uh, Saint Stephen or Saint Etienne uh, application in Metz, is to explore different affordances and different design possibilities that um, augmented reality can enable, but certainly one of them is the panorama. And I want to just mention 
uh, in, in, in this same uh, context, other applications that um, deal with the relationship between historical imagery or images and the current contemporary scene. Um, this uh, application, which is not d done by the um, AEL uh, at Georgia Tech, it's a commercial application called What Was There, is representative of a class of such apps in which the user can uh, look at historical photographs in context. So here I'm looking at the present, at a current uh, video image of the Biltmore Hotel in Atlanta, which just happens to be right outside our um, research lab. And with what was there, there's a um, historic image of that same street taken in, 19, in the 1960s, 1961. And by, hold, by going out and holding the phone up and seeing that image, I can place that image in context. It becomes a kind of view into the past. And um, what was there gives you a slider so that you can uh, decrease or increase the opacity of that image and therefore see you know, the one building, the building as it was, merge into the current building. What's interesting in this case is, of course, that the building hasn't changed that much, but the surroundings, the what the street used to look like compared to today have changed drastically. History. I want to now shift gears and talk about uh, the panorama as a historical uh, exhibition um, technology and exhibition phenomenon. Because panoramas and even panoramic photography actually have a history that goes back. It goes back in this case to the late uh, 18th century when a portrait painter named Robert Barker had the idea of painting giant um, 360 degree panoramic paintings and creating exhibit experiences out of them such that uh, users, oops, I don't have, I don't have that image of the, okay, so um, yes, this is what it was like for a user in uh, circa 1793 of user, a viewer in 1793, to experience this panorama. They would go uh, into this uh, rotunda building, they would go up these stairs, and um, you know they could go as far as the railing and look around, and they would see a 300, and they could go all the way around. They would see a 360 degree painting of London. And interestingly, this kind of immersive feeling was so um, enjoyable that people would pay three shillings to go into this building to see a panoramic vision of the city they were in, which they could have by just walking around. Now, obviously, you know, you get a better uh, vantage point here, but it was clearly the representational experience that was as important as any information they were getting. Um, this is an example of, uh, a, this is an etching made of, the, of, a, of a version of Barker's um, panorama of London. Uh, laid out as a flat image. I don't, and, and we actually we can take that image and put it into Argonne and actually have a panoramic experience, although it's not, this is not obviously um, a panorama created with uh, contemporary um, uh, projection uh, so that it doesn't have, it doesn't look quite right when you put it into uh, something like tourist or put it in argon. However, you do get quite a, uh, something of that same proprioceptic, uh, proprioceptive effect as you, um, as you feel your way around the experience. Stephen Otterman has written a book on the panorama as the history of a mass medium, which gives you a fascinating um, history of this uh, exhibition, which lasted all through the 19th century. It was quite a vogue in the 19th century, in which not only um, cityscapes and landscapes uh, were were painted, but also historic battles, so that you could go and see uh, the Battle of Waterloo. Um, it also carried over to the North American continent, and there is in Atlanta a panoramic uh, painting of the Battle of Atlanta from the Civil War, which still survives. Very few of these panoramic exhibitions are still available today, but there are some in Europe and, and a few in the United States. Now. Why did I talk about history panoramas? Well, I want to argue uh, that this detour into history actually could be useful for the way we think about how to use panorama, uh, panoramic technology, panoramic images in uh, augmented reality today. And I want to argue that the 
discipline we call media studies, thinking about the relationships of media in the past to the present, can have a can be useful uh, for thinking about how we design media today in this digital era. And so I put uh, Marshall McLuhan up here as my icon, found uh, arguably the founder of media studies, um, because I th he because he's also someone who's appealed to even today by media scholars. Uh, he th he asked the question, what is the relationship of earlier media to media today? And um, came up with answers that, um, while they're some still while they're controversial, help us think about uh, about media in the current environment. So in particular, he said, all media are extensions of some human facility, psychic or physical. For example, television, which was the leading uh, sort of new technology of McLuhan's uh, day in the 1960s, he argued was leading us to a fundamental change in our perceptual systems, um, leading to a new kind of human being that he called electronic man. Now, I would argue that McLuhan was actually talking about what we might call aesthetics, um, the aesthetics of media. Not just aesthetics in the sense of the beautiful or the pleasing, but aesthetics in the original sense of how we feel of our perceptual systems. And um, as a branch of philosophy and art history, of course, aesthetics goes back for centuries and indeed thousands of years. But in the past decade or so, aesthetics has also become a, uh, an issue in uh, design and in the HCI community with widespread interest uh, really raised first by Don Norman in, his article, uh, Emotion and Design, published in Interactions in 2002, and then uh, with a burgeoning of research and thinking uh, about aesthetics as emotional response to the environments, to the interfaces that we design. Um, people like uh, Peter Wright and John McCarthy and many others talked about the, uh, have introduced the terms emotive, if, uh, affective, or even tangible into our vocabulary of design for technology. Um, but um, aesthetics can have an even broader meaning. As I was suggesting, aesthetic can refer to the way we perceive. And I think that that is clearly the way Marshall McLuhan meant for us to think about it in his uh, media as the extensions of some human faculty, uh, physical or psychic. Um, at least for the most important forms of media technology. And um, in particular, for television, he argued that television was synesthetic, that uh, synesthesia or unified and a unified sense uh, of imaginative life had long seemed an unattainable dream to Western poets, painters, and artists in general. They were not prepared to have their dreams realized in everyday life by the aesthetic action of radio and television. Radio and television, these massive extensions of our central nervous system, have enveloped Western man in daily sen uh, sessions of synesthesia. So the idea that technologies, as particularly media technologies, can have this effect of changing our perceptual and even perhaps proprioceptual relationship to the world is something that McLuhan was talking about 50 years ago, and it's something that I think we can be talking about profitably today. If we think about the aesthetics of technologies of immersion, for example, which is, um, as you see, I have in the lower left-hand corner there uh, the... Uh, Barker's panorama, the panorama the exhibition of the 19th century, but there are lots of other examples of technology of immersion, trompe l'oeil painting, and indeed even um, film in the 20th century can be thought of as a technology of immersion. We can see that as one kind of um, aesthetic that certain technologies uh, promote. And um, it's also obviously the aesthetic of virtual reality. So uh, virtual reality technology since the 1980s or so has been promoting a kind of immersive aesthetic um, and uh, in the film world popularized by films like The Matrix in which the protagonist is, and the whole human population is in a giant virtual reality. But in uh, today's world, we actually live in a different aesthetic, I think. Uh, the mixed media aesthetic of 
all of these different kinds of social media, of games, of um, the World Wide Web. And now, in particular, with mobile devices, that mixed media aesthetic is promulgated, is extended even to uh, these, uh, to a kind of uh, geolocation, to physical locations in space, as well as locations in cyberspace. And what we need to do is to find an aesthetic that's appropriate for designing in this new world of many multiple technologies coming at us at, at the same time in, in different um, modes. So um, what I'd like to argue is that we need to think about not synesthesia, as McLuhan did, but maybe something called polyesthesia. And I'm appealing here in particular to the work of my uh, colleague, Maria Engberry, who coined this term polyesthetics to describe this a polyphony of emergent digital forms that are taking their place beside television and film, as well as the traditional arts. The polyesthetic is evident in media environments that call in more dimensions of the human sensorium than uh, earlier. And, um, and in particular, I think we can think about the polyesthetics of the panorama, the augmented reality panorama, as opposed to the immersive aesthetics of the panorama of Barker's day. So augmented reality is a new environment in which panoramas are functioning and one that is significantly different from that earlier environment and different in a couple of ways. One is that um, AR panoramas combine senses of sight and touch and, and potentially if inside experiences we can have sounds as well. Um, as you saw when I held up the panorama of the uh, cathedral, I'm feeling my way around the environment, not just looking at the environment as I would in a traditional, um, in television or in film or in earlier forms. And panoramic in another, er, polysthetic in another sense that augmented reality um, panoramas um, with those we're here and there at the same time. That is to say, we are still conscious of the fact that we're standing in a particular location in the real world because the um, phone doesn't cover our field of view. It doesn't cover up the rest of our uh, senses. It augments them. But at the same time, the panorama is taking us to other places as we, as we move around and explore uh, the visual space on the screen. So, and, and indeed, uh, not just... Um, Argon and not just uh, tradition, not just uh, full-blown AR panoramas. Uh, one can also think about the "What Was There" example that I just gave you, um, where we can look at the Biltmore Hotel. We see the historical um, part of it overlaid. The slide, the the image, the experience is taking you into the past, but it's also you're also in the present at the same time. And as you use the slider, you are sliding yourself back and forth in time. Um, I think those AR games too fall under the rubric of polyesthetic. Um, Nerd Herder um, is one in which I'm using the actual phone or the tablet, whatever is my, the uh, platform for the game, to feel my way around this uh, visual, virtual visual space that is also part of my physical space. So there's a proprioceptive and, and polyesthetic uh, relationship that, uh, or design element that I'm taking part in. So the point is that in specific, the specific case of augmented reality panoramas, I think, provides a specific example of the need for a new design aesthetic, one that takes count, uh, account of the um, multiple and uh, tactile and synesthetic and polyesthetic um, experience that I'm having, um, different from the design aesthetics that you would have used for uh, information that's just being delivered on a screen or, or for um, earlier media forms. Um, if you'd like to read more about this uh, notion of polyesthetic design, um, I and my colleagues Maria and Blair have an article coming out in Interactions, uh, ACM Interactions, in January of 2013, in which we discuss this in detail. But, I, but the point that I would like to close with is that although I've been talking very specifically uh, and wanted, and I think it's important to focus on specifics in these kinds of arguments, wanted to talk very specifically about the relationship of media history to current digital practice in the case of these AR panoramas, that's just one very specific case of the larger 
uh, issue of how we design for these new mobile environments. And there, too, I would like to argue, along with my colleagues, that um, a kind of aesthetic design that is polyesthetic, that takes into account the multiple modes of input and the tactile as well as visual relationships, is the appropriate or an appropriate form of design. And it's a way that which in which we can come up with interfaces and, inter and interactive experiences that do justice to uh, the platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Let's have some questions. Do we have a mic ready? Wonderful. Henriette, I know you are very inspired by Jay's work, also working with your students. You, I'm sure you got a question for him. You need to think a moment. Sorry. <laughs> yes, we got a question down there. Um, just taking into account uh, all that you've said, how specific do you think it can be with guidelines for design? So um, I, I don't mean to suggest that we can come up with a set of, you know, 10 guidelines for how to design for augmented environments, even for very specific cases like augmented uh, panoramas, uh, AR panoramas. I think it's more a question of coming up with a design um, philosophy and a design, perhaps a design vocabulary that embodies that philosophy. Um, and then uh, applying it um, flexibly to, uh, you know, particular uh, design problems uh, to come up with solutions. And in this case, as I'm saying, the philosophy that we want to try to promote is a philosophy of this, uh, acknowledging the multiplicity, acknowledging the, uh, the polyvalent character of um, an augmented reality experience. There are still some people who talk about augmented reality as if it were virtual reality. And they imagine that we're going to have applications in which we hold up the phone and we won't be able to tell that, you know, the, the figure here is virtual. They actually look perfectly like a, you know, an actual talking human being. I think that, that that's probably not going to be a very, a very fruitful path to head down as we uh, think about augmented reality design. More fruitful will be to acknowledge the multiplicity because the, Basic to augmented reality, I think, is the notion that you have information from the digital world overlaid on, on experience of the physical world. And I think that would be the ultimate um, arbiter, the ultimate test of the success of an AR, uh, of an AR design, is that it acknowledges that, uh, that basic dichotomy. I would say that uh, what you're raising, we already also talked a lot about that in transmedia area because we used in broadcast to kind of sculpture in time. If you think about it, most media format been sculpture in time from the radio. First radio were hanging on the wall, looked a little bit like a telephone, and had time schedules. So we've been very, very used to every kind of format is kind of in a time, and we actually call film sculpturing in time. And then in interactive and transmedia, we start doing it in attention, but now we have to come up with a whole new kind of key aesthetic system I'm very inspired by architects and attraction architects because they have this kind of, there's the room, be that virtual or physical, uh, there's a movement, uh, there's kind of your perception in the room and so on. So I think we're probably going to build up an aesthetic system from different arts and areas to figure this out. Mm -hmm. A lot of people talking about key aesthetics. Can we actually take kind of, a uh, Peter, I remember last year where we did a huge workshop here in Sweden, uh, Kulturkraft Sud sponsored it, we had a lot of artists from different areas, and we ended up talking about key aesthetics. Can we, from each art form or media form or entertainment uh, format, take out key aesthetics and have kind of a toolbox, a catalog? And probably yeah. uh, that's what's going to happen with a lot of these type of digital experiences. Yeah, I agree, and I think that it is important. Uh, the notion, uh, th you sometimes hear people say, we need to throw out everything that we knew before when we have a new medium. But in fact, I don't think that either is possible or makes sense. But what you what a new medium does, I think McLuhan, you know, we can appeal to McLuhan here, is it reconfigures our relationship to older media. It reconfigures uh, configures potentially our relationship to our environment. And so therefore aesthetic principles from earlier media forms can in fact fruitfully be borrowed, but they can't be taken over whole heartedly. They have to, we have to understand, we have to adjust, we have to combine, we have to recombine 
when we think about the aesthetic design principles of a new, uh, new platform. We got a question down there. I have a question, Jay. I mean, the, I mean, the history of photography is littered with, you know, stereograms and panoramas of the 19th century that, you know, were adopted by the rising middle class of Europe and America. And in a sense, they kind of faded from the history of photography. Do we run the same risk with, you know, augmented reality? Is it, in a sense, a fad because, you know, multitudes of people have smartphones and multitudes of well, people can take panoramas? You know, how do we create some type of real aesthetic? So, I mean, I, on the one hand, I would uh, agree with you wholeheartedly that the history of, you know, say, f photography as a general category is filled with the specific histories of techniques and technologies. I wouldn't necessarily say they're, it's littered with them. In other words, the sense that, th that they were necessarily failures. The e exhibition panorama lasted for 100 years, and it was seen by millions and millions of people all throughout Europe and North America. I would love our AR technology to last 100 years and be that, that influential. The fact that it ran its course um, is not surprising, and I don't think, and, you know, we, I guess what I'm saying is I don't think we should expect aesthetic principles to last forever any more than we expect particular technologies to. And that what we need are the appropriate uh, design principles, appropriate aesthetics for appropriate technologies. Now, so I, whether AR is a fad in the sense that it lasts, you know, if it lasts five years, one will be a little disappointed. But um, if it corresponds to uh, the needs and interests of a significant community of users and designers, the fact that it has a you know a lifespan, I don't think should should dissuade us from trying to understand its aesthetic possibilities. We're going to take one more question and then we take a break. Yes, I have actually I actually have a question to you. Your prediction about fall on augmented reality in video games. My prediction? Yeah. Well, when do you think approximately we're going to see it? Well, they exist now. I mean, the question is how popular, you know, do they, are they going to be as big as, uh, you know, console games? Or are they, you know, they're going to, uh, and I'm actually, first of all, I would be foolish to try to predict that. I don't know the game industry well enough. And it also seems to me that even people who do know those kinds of things often, you know, lose millions of dollars on such predictions. Um, if, if these AR games become a significant uh, segment or niche, or they become a genre, I think would probably be a better term than niche. If they become a genre, then, you know, then I think that's interesting and, and, and they may well be on their way to becoming a genre. Um, one thing about the game world that really strikes me is that it's, in, it's remarkably varied and and uh, there are lots of different, when people talk about games, they often generalize and they, th they often act as if the only kind of video game is the first person shooter that, you know, teenage boys like. But in fact, there are, you know, on the other hand, you'll hear the statistic that more women now play games than, than, than men. Which games, right? There are downloadable games from the internet, there are flash games, there are casual games, there are role playing games, there are, you know, and, and so it's an, it's an enormous world. I think these kinds of, especially the tabletop um, augmented reality games, have the potential to, becoming, to become a significant uh, genre and therefore to have a design um, impact on the design community. We have to stop here. So all the things you want to ask Jay, you see if you're one of the lucky ones yeah, who can catch him. Let's give him a hand. Thank you.